Now, to talk about the gains from trade specifically, we're going to need to define and describe two different concepts. And these concepts are known as consumer surplus and producer surplus. Okay? Now, consumer surplus, which I'm just going to abbreviate as CS, <clears throat> this is the additional gains to consumers as a result of a trade. Okay, <clears throat> and to calculate it, we need to know two things. So to figure to calculate, we need to know two things. One, we need to know their maximum willingness to pay and two we need to know how much they actually paid okay so <clears throat> we need to figure out how much someone was actually willing to pay, like the absolute maximum amount that they would ever possibly pay for something. And then we need to know how much they actually paid for it. Okay, <clears throat> so <clears throat> how can we figure this out? So for example, uh, not to endorse anything, but I bought a cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee this morning. It cost me t roughly $2.50. Okay, so we know how much I paid. So in my example for Dunkin' Donuts coffee, right? I paid two fifty, let's say. Okay. I'd be willing to pay because this was my first cup of coffee for the day. I'd be willing to pay how about let's say seven dollars for it. Okay. That is the absolute most, like if Dunkin' Donuts charged me $7, I would be basically indifferent between the $7 and the coffee. I decided to take a sip of it right there because this has got me thinking about my coffee. Okay, So we would say that my consumer surplus is equal to the $7 minus the $2.50, which is equal to $4.00 and 50 cents worth of additional value. Now this is why I particularly like Dunkin Donuts is because every time I go there I pay two dollars and fifty cents for something that I value at seven dollars which means that by having the coffee instead of my 250 I gain four dollars and fifty cents worth of additional value. This is like you know if you've ever gone to the store and you walked out of there thinking you know man I got a great deal that's the consumer surplus that you're feeling. Okay, So I walk out of Dunkin' Donuts every morning thinking, man, I got a great deal here. I paid $2.50 for this coffee. That was awesome. It's great coffee, and it only cost me $2.50. What a deal. Okay, So how can we determine this? Okay, How can we figure out what my consumer surplus would be? Okay, And to do that, we can use supply and demand. Okay. So here's my demand for coffee. It's downward sloping, which reflects that each additional unit or each additional cup of coffee is worth less to me than the, first, the previous one. They have a supply of coffee. Okay. And this determines the price. Okay. Now for my first cup of coffee, like I said, this is coffee cup number one. I am willing to pay seven dollars, okay? But I only paid two, or 250 rather, okay? So this was 250, okay? And this distance right here, all right? <clears throat> In fact, uh, this that distance right there is the four dollars and fifty cents, okay? <clears throat> and so what this means is that this entire triangle right here, if we were to continue trading, so if I got my second cup of coffee, which I might value at, uh, how about you know, $5, right? That's my second one. 
Okay. <clears throat> this entire triangle right here is going to be the consumer surplus. So consumer surplus is equal to all of the area underneath demand and above the price. Okay, so consumer surplus is this entire triangle that is underneath the demand curve, which shows me my maximum willingness to pay, and above the price, which shows what I actually pay, right? And that difference between these two tri or these two lines, the demand and the price, that's going to be my consumer surplus. Okay. <clears throat> now producer surplus, I'm going to try to write it over here. Producer surplus, that is just going to it's going to be just like consumer surplus, but it's going to be about the producers. So this is the additional gains to producers as a result of trade. Okay, now, now Dunkin' Donuts, let's say that the first cup of coffee to make costs them about 50 cents. But they get to sell it for $2.50, which means that they gain $2 worth of value by selling me the coffee. All right, so their producer surplus is all of this, is this 50 cents that it costs them, subtracted from the price, all right, which is $2.50. So here, for their first cup of coffee, their producer surplus was $2. All right? Now the second cup of coffee, it might cost them a dollar to make in terms of marginal costs. And this is admittedly a, a somewhat weird example because you know the second cup of coffee that Duncan makes probably doesn't cost twice as much to make for them. But the increasing opportunity cost, et cetera, right, it ends up making a little bit more sense. Okay, so what we have is all of this area here being the producer surplus. Okay, so this is all of the area above supply and below price. Okay, <clears throat> so all the area above their marginal cost or their supply curve and below the price that they actually receive, that has to be the producer surplus. Okay. <clears throat> and so if we think about this, right, this shows us all the gains from trade. So the triangle up here, this is all the, the consumer, and the triangle down here, that's all the producer's gains, okay? And the size of this triangle, this total big triangle, right, that's going to be the total surplus. So the total gains from trade to all of society will be equal to the producer surplus plus the consumer surplus, or all the gains from everybody, okay? Now, let's apply this to uh, international trade, okay? And we're going to do a, a simpler one, right? We're not going to go into the world market with the three graphs, you know, again. We're just going to focus on the U.S. Uh, market for wine, okay? The U.S. market for wine. We have a demand curve and we have a supply curve. Now, the U.S., as, as before, is going to be an importer of wine. So we know the world price is going to be down below. Okay, And this world price here, that reflects the price that domestic consumers pay. And it also reflects the price that domestic producers receive. Okay, So the consumer surplus, remember, is all the area below demand and above the price that is paid. Okay, so that's going to be all of this. All right, this whole gigantic triangle here all of it, so this big triangle right here, that's going to be the consumer surplus. Okay, 
And the producer surplus, remember, is all the area above supply and below the price received. Okay. <clears throat> and so that's going to be all the area above this supply curve here and below this world price here. So it's got to be this triangle there. Okay. <clears throat> so notice that these triangles don't have to be symmetric. They don't have to be the same size. They don't have to even be really the same shape. Right? They're both triangular, uh, but one could be, you know, weird shape and the other could be flat. It could be whatever you want, okay? depending on the shape or the slopes of the supply and demand curves. So what we have here are consumers benefiting tremendously from consumption, domestic consumers, I should say, and the domestic producers only getting a little bit of surplus here. Okay, <clears throat> So what we've got right, is a, a difference Right? But again, right, we've got a difference in the size, so it's true that you know, importing goods benefits consumers a lot more than it benefits producers, right? and that's going to be that's going to be definitionally true. And in fact, as we're going to see, or if you if we could actually, let's just do it. So let's compare uh, two different states of the world. So this is something that people often think about, and and our current president, Donald Trump, is is very much obsessed with this. So let's just illustrate what he's saying. Okay, so we've got demand and supply. We've got what the domestic price would be if there were no international trade. And we've got the world price, which is the price there is if there's, let's say, unfettered or completely uh, free completely free international trade so there's no rules no restrictions no nothing okay so in this world so first off in the world where there's no international trade okay what we have is consumer surplus that's going to be right here okay all right that shape there okay so there's the consumer surplus and I'm going to show you, uh, let's say, producer surplus will be this here. Okay. And it's this here. And I'll explain why I use two different colors to show the same thing in a second. Okay. So in a world where there is no international trade, if there were no international trade between, let's say, the U.S. and China, for whatever market we're trading, producer, consumer surplus would be this black triangle here, and producer surplus would be the, the red triangle and this blue trapezoidy thing, okay? And if we lowered, uh, if we lowered barriers and we allowed uh, international trade, then, I guess I have to get another color, I'll use a green marker from class. And this smells terrible. Okay, so we'll just color this in real fast. Coloring with the flat end makes a lot easier. Okay, so here we go, right? <clears throat> in a world where there is there's no international trade, consumers get this black triangle and producers get the blue and the red. Okay. But when there is international trade, producers get the red, and consumers get the black, the blue, and the green. Right? Now, Donald Trump is correct to note that when there is international trade, domestic producers are made worse off. Because look, if there were no international trade, producers, American producers, would have this big triangle of the red and the blue. Okay? But when there is international trade, they only get the red, okay? So if they're only getting the red with international trade and they would get red and blue with, without international trade, then it's true that international trade, when we import things, makes the domestic producers worse off, 
Okay, that is definitionally true. There's no denying it. It's just straight up, this blue was producer surplus, and then it wasn't. Okay, so the producers lose blue. Okay, but notice that consumers, when there is international trade, they get the blue shape. Okay, so they get blue, and then they also get green. So all the value of blue is still surplus. It just changes hands to you and me instead of being go instead of going to producers. It goes to you and I as consumers, and then we also get green. So the benefit here, so the benefit to America when we consider both producers and consumers, right? If we consider both producers and consumers of international trade is the green triangle. Right? <clears throat> because check it out one more time. Before international trade, the total surplus was right here. It was the black, the black triangle, the blue trapezoid, and the red triangle. That was the total surplus. But when there was international trade and the price, the domestic price falls down to the world price, then the total surplus is equal to the black, the blue, the green, and the red. Okay? So total surplus increases. Okay, consumers gain the blue and the green, and the producers lose the blue. So producers are made worse off, but consumers are made far better off, more than enough better off, to make up for the producer's loss. Okay, and given that we're all pr both producers and consumers, what we lose as producers, we gain as consumers, and then we gain again as consumers in the form of this green. Okay, so the, the implications of this are that trade benefits people. It tends to benefit people. It, hurt, it might hurt specific people in their productive lives, okay, but it helps them in their consumptive lives, all this area here. Okay. <clears throat>